morning. God bless you. Welcome to Dade City First United Methodist Church. I'm Robert Roseberry, pastor here at this community of faith. And if you're new to our church this morning, we're glad that you chose to worship with us. We do have a guest information card on the table back in the entryway, the narthex that you came in through this morning. We'd love to get to know you a little better, so we'd appreciate you filling it out when you get a chance. You can put that card in the offering plate after you've filled it out today. Uh, there are announcements in your weekly update that you should have gotten as you came in today. Uh, let me go over a few of them as we get closer to some important events in the life of our church. Uh, we want to thank, I want to thank everyone who came to be part of our Ash Wednesday Remembrance this past week. I know it was new to everyone, uh, or most of you, and I appreciate you giving it a shot and uh, coming to participate in that. Uh, thank you for uh, giving it a try so faithfully, and we're glad that you came. We had 62 people through on Ash Wednesday, so we're excited. It's good for a first time. And uh, we also have our informational meeting next Sunday from 2 to 4.30 in the CLC. We'll have Reverend Nako Kellum from the Global Methodist Church and Reverend Dr. David Allen, who is our district superintendent in the North Central here in the North Central District of the Florida Conference. They'll both be presenting information about the current controversy in our United Methodist Church, as well as presenting information about our options on staying with the United Methodist Church. We're going to have light refreshments available during the meeting thanks to our hospitality team, and I hope that you will come to that. It's very important that you come and attend that. Uh, it's the next step in our congregational discussion on human sexuality and the United Methodist Church, and this information meeting is important not only to correct any misinformation out there, and Lord knows there's a lot of it. We'll be holding the church conference March the 12th, which is two Sundays from now, in the CLC to vote on whether First United Methodist Church will continue as a United Methodist Church. You'll all be getting calls and a letter from the church in the coming days, so this announcement will also be in writing. You'll have that on that letter. Uh, registration and ballot distribution will begin at 1.30 so that you have time to leave worship that Sunday, grab lunch, and then get back to church. I'll make sure that you beat the Baptists that Sunday. Uh, the church conference will begin at 2.30, so the actual meeting begins at 2.30. We think that registration and ballot distribution will be about an hour so please get there early so that we can make sure you have a ballot. Uh, attendance will be limited to members of First United Methodist Church uh, who have voice and vote in the church conference. According to paragraph 2553 of our discipline, which lays out church law, structure, procedure, and doctrine, it will take a two-thirds majority of the members present to, appro to approve a motion to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. Approval of this motion would mean a few things. This would initiate the process whereby First UMC would sever ties with the United Methodist Church. There are steps that you'll learn about at the informational meeting on March the 5th and other things to think about um, before that vote. And while both myself and the church council would love to take more time uh, before making such a big decision, uh, we're doing this soon to provide clarity to the Florida Conference as they decide on appointments that will begin this coming summer. They're already having those conversations. If First United Methodist Church disaffiliates, they will need to find another church for me to serve. Uh, if First United Methodist Church does not disaffiliate, then I have already requested to stay here with all of you. And we also owe it to the staff of the church who are all trying to make plans for their ministries and for their futures with First United Methodist Church as well. Both myself and Katie also live in houses that are owned by the church, so this affects more than just our jobs here at the church. And whether you think your mind is made up or not, the informational meeting next Sunday is extremely important for you to attend so that you can make an informed vote at the conference. It can help clear up any misinformation you might have heard and set straight the facts around disaffiliation. There's been a lot of not true stuff floating around, and this meeting will help you get it directly from the mouths of both of the horses um, so that you understand. Uh, and we also, I want to encourage everyone, if you have a question, uh, for any of the speakers, please email that or somehow give that to the church office before March the 1st, or, or by March the 1st, excuse me, so that Valerie can send them to the speakers. Uh, we're not going to turn the meeting into anything but an informational meeting, so we're not going to have speeches, we're not going to have all that kind of stuff. There will not be a vote at the informational meeting. We're asking everyone to turn in their questions ahead of time so that everything is orderly and we all can listen and uh, see what the speakers have to present. Um, as a church council and as your pastor, 
We ask everyone to love, honor, and pray for each other during this time. Following the words of Paul in Ephesians 4, let us bear with one another in love, even when we disagree or vote differently at the future meeting. Now, there's no other way to continue on from that, so I'll just transition to other announcements that are much less weighty, uh, and thank you all for listening to that. And uh, good transition is that Glenn has upper rooms back there in the narthex, if you were waiting for your upper room today. See, look at that. There's a transition. But let me remind everyone about our Wednesday night dinners. As we hit the final month of our spring season, please turn in those registrations and let us know you're coming if you haven't already. Our youth ministry after the Wednesday night dinner this week is having a parent and volunteer meeting. So we'll go over summer plans and a few more items you'll want to know if you're a parent or a volunteer in our youth ministry. Now let's stand and sing as we're able our first hymn, We Welcome the Light of Christ into Our Worship. We'll sing number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness. begins with a single step. Quoth, an ancient Chinese philosopher, smart guy, named Lao Tzu. The word journey is often how we describe this season we're in called Lent. The colors are purple and gold to remind us of the king whom we follow and whom we bow down before in this season of penitence and preparation for Easter. And implied in that word journey are two things. Number one, that we are moving that we are walking with Christ. And Christ is, as he usually is, on his way somewhere. And that's the second implication. We have a destination. This journey isn't just random wandering in the wilderness. 
even though it might feel that way, we are on a path. We are moving toward the cross, and that's our destination. It isn't Easter sunrise as much as we may want it to be, but our destination is earthly, real, and unfortunately painful. It requires sacrifice and surrender. And if you gave up something for Lent, you've probably already experienced a little bit of that feeling of sacrifice. I had somebody who told me that you know their, their Lenten commitment was to give up drinking alcohol, and they were at dinner last night, and they said, I think I'll have a glass of... Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> and they all of a sudden remembered what their Lenten commitment was. Or you might have another thing. It might be that piece of chocolate that you grab, and you're like, wait, I was going to give up sweets. Uh-oh. Or after you've already eaten it, you realize, doggone it, I was going to give up sweets. And that small little sacrifice is so tiny compared to what Jesus sacrificed for us, but it gives us a taste, pun intended, of what following Jesus should be. Because the journey to the cross is a journey laden with struggle. It's a wrestling match with our greatest foe, ourselves. Old Pogo had it right. We have met the enemy and he is us. And because he is us, this journey is an inner journey, at least in part, and we'd rather give it a pass. Most of the time, we do, unfortunately. After all, it's everyone else who is the problem, right? If it weren't for them, everything would be peachy. But our journey, our Lenten journey of a thousand miles, begins with Jesus taking his journey into the wilderness in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Matthew and Luke say that he was led up, while Mark says that the Spirit drove him there. Either way, Jesus didn't decide without some prompting. Like us, he might have asked the question, is this all really worth it? And ultimately, both for him and for us, Jesus decided it was worth it. And he took that first step. So old Lao Tzu was right. It's about standing and stepping. It's about taking the first step, putting our hands in his hand and taking that first step on the road to the cross. It's a long path journey but one worth taking so walk with me walk with him all the way to the cross during this lent if you haven't made your first step on that journey with christ let this week be an invitation to do just that and we will be honored here at first umc to be a part of that journey in your weekly update this week you'll see a prayer list as you usually do we invite you to take that home with you Pray for these names throughout the week. Whether you know them or not, God knows your prayers and your heart for your church family. If you'd like to submit a prayer request, there is a gray two-sided prayer request card on the entryway table. And you can fill it out and put it in the offering plate, or you can email the church office. As we enter our time of prayer this morning, would you open your heart to the words of Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept my silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct and teach you the way you should go, says the Lord. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let us pray. Holy God, as we seek your word for us in your holy scripture, let us see this episode that we'll read from the life of Jesus as also a part of our lives. That whenever the tempter says, since you are Lord, Lord God, help us prove that we are your people. 
If we are the people of God, Lord, help our love flow from the inside out to God, neighbor, self, and all creation. Lord, help us prove that we are your people. Since we are followers of Christ, our faith should plant seeds of justice so we can reap a harvest of reconciliation and healing where once violence and desolation took root. God, help us prove that we are your people. Since we are students of the Holy Spirit, Lord, help our hope dream a world of flourishing for all of God's creation. Inspire us to spread God's abundant life like butter on warm toast. God, help us prove that we are your people. Whenever the tempter says, since you are, let us remember, God, you say you are mine. God, as the people you claim is your own, teach us to live in and return to love, faith, and hope whenever we fall. Help us to walk in salvation with your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let me ask you all to stand as you're able. Turn your hymnals to page 377. Our next hymn is It Is Well With My Soul. We'll sing verses 1 through 3. seated. Let us pray for our morning offering as we prepare to give it. Generous God, as we remember Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, 
We acknowledge the temptation that pursues so many of us to measure our worth, our power, and our security by what we have. As we offer these gifts to you this morning, we pray that you might deliver us from the temptation of building our lives around what belongs to us. Continually lead us to the conviction that what matters is that we belong to you. We pray in the name of our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. If you please rise for our doxology as you are able. seated. Thank you, choir. As we read our scripture passage, we're reading from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And a quick word about the translation. Um, you have New Revised Standard Version, I believe, listed in your bulletin. Uh, and as I was doing the Bible study and kind of 
um, putting the final touches on it, I realized that um, I actually needed another translation because of one small word. Uh, the CEB translates the devil's questions as, since you are the Son of God. The New Revised Standard Version translates it as, if you are the Son of God. And as I dug into that a little bit, it's a really nerdy thing to do. It's just a little tiny word in Greek. I think it's two Greek letters. Um, but I realized that really God made, I, I needed to do the since you are the Son of God version instead of the if you are the Son of God. So in the Pew Bibles, I believe, are New Revised Standard Version. So if you are now have those out and you're going to read through them, you'll notice that there's a word difference. And that is why it's a disagreement among the Bible translators as to what the appropriate word is. But for today's sermon, it's the Common English Bible. That's the correct version. That's what we're going to go with. Um, so here we go. Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. The tempter came to him and said, Since you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. Jesus replied, It's written, People won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. After that, the devil brought him into the holy city and stood him at the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, since you are God's son, throw yourself down. For it is written, I will command my angels concerning you and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't even hit your foot on a stone. Jesus replied, again it is written, don't test the Lord your God. Then the devil brought him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I will give you all of these if you bow down and worship me. Jesus responded, go away, Satan, because it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left and the angels came and took care of him. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Like I said, that little small Greek word makes a big difference in this passage. A lot of Bible nerds, scholars we'll call them, agree that with the common English Bible that it should be since. It doesn't seem like Satan is trying to find out if Jesus is the Son of God, but rather he's trying to find out what exactly is the nature of such a position. And Jesus responds, answering the question, proving he is the Son of God by responding faithfully, as opposed to giving in to the devil. And while this uh, passage is not about the devil, it's about Jesus, let's take a moment to also talk about what this would have represented in Jesus' career as a rabbi. People reading this would have said, oh, this is his review, or it might have been called a different thing, but early rabbis would have, as they're going through what we would probably call the ordination process, they would get to this point in the process where they were, you know, sitting before a board of other rabbis who were quizzing, and it was kind of like a courtroom. There was a jury, essentially, there was kind of a jury of rabbis. There was a judge, and there was a defense attorney, an advocate, and there was a prosecutor, an accuser. His role was called ha-satan. Might sound familiar. And this rabbi's job, the Satan, his, rabbi, his job was to make sure that everybody in that jury knew every wrong word you had ever done. Every time you told your grandmother and your mother no, every time you disobeyed your parents, every time you did something bad, every time you looked at somebody cross, every single thing bad about you. And his job was to prove that you did not need to be a rabbi. This was another rabbi who played this part in the courtroom. He was the opposition, the tempter to tempt you to believe that you weren't good enough and to tempt everybody else to believe that you weren't good enough either. He was the adversary, the accuser. That was his job. And in this, in this little episode of Jesus' led, this is what Jesus is going through. He's being tempted to serve someone else instead of God. He's being tempted to believe that he needs to get through by other means. And each time Jesus is tempted by the devil, he responds with the Torah. And even when the devil quotes Psalm 91, Torah wins out. 
Because some scripture might be more important. But Torah wins out. In each temptation, Jesus is asked to diminish himself in relation to Satan. To look selfishly within, as one scholar has said. To lift the devil up and throw himself, Jesus, down. So the central thing that the devil is looking for here, and what we can look for as we look at this passage, is what does the Son of God look like? What does it look like to have that kind of power and status? This episode's eerily similar to an episode in chapter 27 when the chief priests lead Jesus away and hand him over, hand Jesus over to Pilate. And Pilate's question asks a similar question. Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? Are you? But what is the nature of Jesus' kingship, really? Pilate expects a king to have wealth, political clout, <clears throat> and military strength. In a similar way, Satan's questions are about wealth and power. Jesus is a very disappointing son of God to Satan, just as he is a disappointing king to Pilate. Satan is well versed in scripture, tries to use it against Jesus, but ultimately Jesus' command of scripture is stronger because simply knowing scripture in your head is not enough. Jesus often says in this gospel and in others, you have heard it said, but I say to you, because the word of God is more than the printed words on the page. It is the way of God, which does not include giving in to easy paths of surface level victories. And Jesus' temptations, <clears throat> Jesus' temptations are still our temptations. Although none of us are tempted to turn stone to bread or to launch ourselves off a building and survive, we are still tempted to pursue other paths to wealth, influence, and power. We are still tempted to seek shortcuts, to ignore God's will, and pursue goals that promise fulfillment but only lead to emptiness, to promise us the biggest teddy bear in the world but only leave us with unlicensed Disney merchandise. Love, connect, love it when it connects to the children's sermon. <laughs> Douglas John Hall, in his, right, in his commentary on this passage, asks the church to beware of certain temptations. Satan's temptation here is the same as in Genesis, really, to attempt to tempt people to become like God. First of all, there's the temptation of the church to attempt the miraculous. And he asks the church to beware of a theology that promises glory without sacrifice, resurrection without crucifixion, and cheap grace. This is why Lent and especially Ash Wednesday are so important. This is our road to the cross with Jesus. And this is how the only way we get to Easter. The second temptation is the temptation to spectacle. Beware an ecclesiology of the local church or local pastor worship. This is the cult of celebrity and it shows up in the church a lot. Us and our church are not the Savior. Only Jesus is. And this spectacle can go a lot of ways too. We, we could have smoke machines to make it look kind of foggy and mysterious up here. We could have all sorts of bells and whistles. But if we don't have God, it doesn't all really matter. And we can also bend people's emotions, manipulate people's emotions in their hearts so that they'll be hanging on your every word. But that's not the calling of Christ. The calling of Christ is to be transparent, to be full of the gospel and the good news. Not to be a celebrity. The next temptation is the temptation of the church to political power. Political power, after all, is all about domination and winning against others. And Jesus' way is about loving and forgiving others. It is about an emptying of power into love. Into a basin of water to wash other people's feet. And as Jesus is being tempted... By Satan, there's a lot going on. What do we do when we find ourselves in that temptation world? I think we ask the question that Satan was asking. I know that may sound odd for your pastor to say that, but just bear with me here. What does a son of God 
look like? And hear the words that Jesus heard. Since you are a son or a daughter of God, since you are, then act a different way. Act the way Je Jesus' actions prove that he is the Son of God. That's what the devil was looking for, right? What does the Son of God look like? What does the Son of God act like? What is a Son of God or a daughter of God like? Jesus shows us through his response to these temptations exactly what a son or a daughter of God is like. They're like salt and light to help people see the, the God see God in the world, to help them taste God in the world, to help them experience God in the world. What is a son or a daughter of God like? They're peacemakers, those who are humble, those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, going all the way back to those beatitudes we read several weeks ago. That is what a son and a daughter of God is like. And Jesus tells us, this is what we are. This is who we are because of whose we are. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to answer questions in our life that calls us. When we hear the devil saying, since you are a son or a daughter of God, help us to respond with a yes, I am. Help us to respond confidently knowing that the love and grace and compassion we show, that the resistance we show to temptations of power and spectacle and wealth, that the resistance we show to serving other gods are a resistance against the very powers of evil. Lord, we're thankful that Jesus went through this trial so that he could be prepared for the cross. This Lent, as we go through our own trials and tribulations, as small as they are compared to that, help us to remember that you are walking with us, hand in hand, toward that same destination. And if we fall down, you are always there to lift us up again. And when we fall down, and surely we will, but when we do, help us to fall down into your arms. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in standing as we repeat and affirm these sacred words in our common and uniting faith through the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand as you're able. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our final hymn is number 382 in your hymnals. Have thine own way, Lord. We'll sing verses 1 and 3.
receive this benediction as we prepare to take our worship outside of these doors. Though we were condemned, we have found pardon. Though death held dominion over our lives, God's grace and gift of righteousness now lives and reigns with us. We are free, we are forgiven, we are alive in Christ. And all God's people said, Amen.